Archaeological and Natural History Society, which is usually known as SANS. My name is Lizzie Indooney and I am a trustee for SANS. Today we're going to hear um, a, a talk about uh, the local listing of heritage from Mary Andrews. Mary trained as an archaeological and architectural conservator, gaining a degree in classical archaeology and a degree in conservation material science from the UCL in London. She fell in love with Britain during her years studying in England, so decided to stay and run a company providing a consultancy for archaeological and architectural conservation. This allowed her the opportunity to work on projects like a park and Windsor Castle, both of which, as you will remember, suffered major fires in the 1990s. She also worked abroad advising on the conservation of Byzantine mosaics in the Museum of Madabar, Jordan. After a decade of working in England, she returned back to the States with her family, where she continued in private practice, primarily for small historic house museums and larger regional museums. In 2020, she and her English husband returned to the UK and are very happily settled in the little village of Luxborough on Exmoor. She spent the last 12 months working for the Southwest Heritage Trust on a pilot project to create a local heritage list for the County of Somerset and Exmoor National Park. So, as usual, Mary will take questions at the end of the talk. To ask questions, you'll need to activate the chat button at the bottom of the page and type in a question. To find the button, just run the mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the top right or even hidden under three top dots. Um, because we are recording this lecture, we won't use names at question time. It's free to register for the talks, but a donation of £5 towards the ongoing costs of SANS would be gratefully appreciated. The donations button is on the SANS website donations page. When donating, please label your donation, saving your heritage. To make things easier, a link to the donations page will also be posted on the chat button at the end of the lecture. So, over to Mary. Uh, good evening. We go. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am Mary Andrews. Um, and as Lizzie said, I have uh, recently um, been working on the local heritage list project for Somerset and Explore National Park. And welcome to everybody tonight. I'm really excited at being, about being able to explain to everyone um, what this project is all about and how hopefully you can become a part of it. So let's get started um, with the presentation here. Now, um, we have titled this talk, Saving Your Heritage, A Closer Look at Local Heritage Listing. Um, as you can see, I'm starting with a lovely illustration, uh, actually a photo taken by Lizzie and Junie herself um, of Watch It Lighthouse. And here is a great example of the sort of um, heritage asset that we are seeking for um, putting onto the local list. So let's get going. Um, I'm going to cover these topics during the course of our time together tonight. I'm going to start out talking about a brief overview of the Local Heritage List pilot project. And um, after giving you a bit of a, ba a background on the project, I'm going to then move on and discuss the importance of the historic environmental record to the um, Local Heritage List, and then talk about defining the scope of the nominations, the sorts of things that we are looking for, um, which then easily segues over then into a, a, a series of examples um, of local heritage list nominations that we are putting forward and which have been sent in to us. And then finally, we will end um, with a Q&A session um, at the very end. So to begin with, just a little bit of background, um, the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities um, has um, given the money for this project. And it's actually, um, they invited um, people throughout the country to um, apply for this money to um, participate in this pilot project. Um, and they ended up granting money to 22 different um, uh, 
counties and districts throughout the country. Um, and uh, with the support of Historic England, which gave um, some guidance, some very broad guidance in how to go about doing it, the two of them are the ones who really um, um, launched this pilot project for 12 months. And basically, each of us, each of the 22 of us within this pilot scheme was asked to take the money that they've given us and go away and create um, a digitized local heritage list um, that could then be accessed by members of the public. Um, so that's basically what we did. We weren't given a whole lot of guidance. We've been a little bit of guidance, but not a whole lot. Um, so what we did was that, um, that certainly within Somerset, we um, created and or invited a bunch of um, partners um, to come in with us on this project to advise us and um, answer our questions and help help us um, with doing what um, we needed to do in order to, to make this project work. So as you can see from the list that I have up here on this slide, um, we had all of the, the five um, local planning authorities <clears throat> um, were represented mostly with their um, conservation officers. We also had three um, areas of outstanding natural beauty um, were represented. And then we had other heritage societies throughout the county, the, um, the Somerset Building Preservation Trust, the Somerset Gardens Trust, SANS and SIAS. Um, and all of these people worked together with us very collaboratively, and they were a huge help to us in helping us pull together um, all the information that we needed in order to create um, a viable um, list that was of use to everybody. So um, what areas are covered by the local heritage list? Well, um, within Somerset, at the moment, we're divided up into five districts, um, Mendip, Sedgemore, South Somerset, Somerset, uh, West and Taunton, and then Exmoor National Park. Um, the it, it, it's it's interesting and, and slightly problematic for us in that um, starting next April, as many of you know, um, we're going to be changing over to a unitary authority in this in this county. So those four districts in blue on your screen um, will become one one unitary authority. Exmoor National Park will retain its independence as its own planning authority. Um, so in creating this local heritage list, we had to plan for the future, as it were, in, in anticipation of, okay, the, these districts and areas are all going to change, and the people within them are going to change in just a few months from now or within a year from now. So we had to make sure that whatever we came up with in terms of our local heritage list, um, the way that it functioned and, 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 and worked, we need to take into account the fact that um, the whole the authority was going to change and morph into something more unitary from what it was. Um, we also had the issue that Exmoor National Park actually straddles two counties. Um, about three quarters of it, as you can see, is in West Somerset, but the other quarter um, kind of bleeds over into North Devon. So we also had to deal with um, coordinating with people in, in two different counties rather than just one. But I will say we persevered, all of our partners were great in helping us and we managed to find a good way forward. So what is the list? Well, basically we were asked to record heritage assets um, which have cultural significance in Somerset and in Exmoor National Park. Now heritage asset is a really wide ranging term. Um, it's, we discussed very early on, you know, gosh, can we get something that sounds a little bit more specific than that, because it is very wide ranging, it's kind of hard to wrap your arms around it. But because what we are looking for with the local heritage list is wide ranging, it's not focused just on buildings. I mean, most people, when they hear the term um, listing, they automatically think statutory listing um, that everyone has heard about grade one, grade two, star grade two, um, and they think buildings. But what we're looking for is something more than just buildings. So by calling them heritage assets, that takes in things more than buildings, it's structures, it's places, it's archeological sites, it's, it's many, many things. And so um, what we're trying to do is encourage members of the public to go out and look in around their surroundings, their local surroundings, and not just at the buildings, but anything that has what they would consider, what we would consider a heritage asset or has heritage value to them. And we're trying to identify those things that are rare, or valuable or even threatened in these local areas um, that, that can be recognized on the local list 
Um, but these are things that perhaps wouldn't wouldn't um, qualify or haven't qualified for national listing, or what we call statutory listing. So that's really what we're what we're aiming for. We're, these these are um, assets which have been overlooked for all these years but we don't want them to be overlooked any longer. This is our opportunity to step up and say, oi, we love this, we love that about this in our village or in our, in our county or in our parish or wherever it might be within Somerset. Um, and we wanna make sure that people recognize that and it gets proper um, protection within the planning process. So I have up here four slides, four pictures, um, which are examples of the sorts of things that we're looking for. You know, the Top left here is just, it's a dew pond. Um, it's it's more of a landscape feature rather than a building. Um, in the upper right, there's a, an aqueduct um, in Chard um, crossing one of their canals. Um, it's, it's an example of old infrastructure. Again, something perfectly suitable for going onto the local list. Um, in the bottom left, it's um, a, a cottage in, on the um, Honeycutt Estate um, on Exmoor in, in Exmoor National Park. Um, also, it didn't quite make the grade for national listing, but locally, it's it's um, it's a fine example of local architecture and it has meaning for the local community. Um, bottom right, it's an old um, um, automobile association sign. Um, there are not actually a whole lot of these left, but again, this is something that harks back to an earlier period, to early early driving and automotive um, history. Um, and again, something that we're looking to preserve and not lose. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, or have been asked a lot over the past year, is like, what are the benefits of local listing? Why do we even bother with this? And I will start out by saying that, um, you know, initially, you know, historic England or English heritage, as it was known back then, um, started back in the 1950s, um, this whole idea of statutory listing, um, where they wanted to go through and identify the you know, the, the, what they call the grade one, um, grade two star and grade two buildings. And these are all buildings of um, and monuments of national importance. Um, and during the course of that, and they did this over about 30 years or so. And over the course of these decades, they, they not only made a list um, of all of these nationally important buildings, but they also kind of swept up a whole bunch of lesser known buildings, which were, were given a designation of um, grade three. Well, by the in the 1980s, they pretty much run out of steam, run out of manpower, run out of money. And all of those grade three buildings just were, ended up in lists and books and shoved away in a dark corner somewhere. And um, I think that what's happened is that really recently, um, Historic England has decided, you know, I think we need to go back and revisit. Um, there are rumblings now that the government is um, talking about relaxing um, some building regulations. Um, which has set off some warning bells within Historic England and other people who work with historic preservation. And so they thought, look, this by creating the local listing project, um, we can then hoover up all of these um, uh, third class buildings, as it were, and, and monuments and, and heritage assets um, and get them um, under a local heritage listing designation um, and try and give them some level of protection at planning stage. So, so one of the benefits um, of doing this local listing is that first and foremost, any asset that goes onto this list will be recognized as a culturally significant asset, which in and of itself is really important. But by doing so, it creates an added layer of scrutiny now for that asset during the planning process. So that um, when um, a planning application comes across the desk of a planning officer, um, if anything is, if, if, if uh, his uh, locally uh, listed building or, or asset um, has been identified on that application, then the planner will know right then and there, ah, okay, I need to pay special attention to this. Now, one of the things that the local heritage list that doesn't do that you find with the statutory listing is that it does not impose any legal restrictions on the owner. For people who live in a listed building, they will tell you, oh yes, I live in a grade two or grade two star building. Um, and there are, there's a series of rules and regulations of things I can and cannot do, um, which can be onerous to some people. But that's not the case with local listing. 
um, there are no um, legal restrictions placed on the owners. Um, all it does really is provide an added layer of scrutiny during that planning process. What we're hoping is that by giving people um, this designation of local listing, that it will um, promote to them a, a pride of place, encourage good management um, um, and care of whatever it is that they own, whether it be a building or a heritage asset on land that they own. Um, and it will kind of celebrate, helps help them to sort of celebrate their local culture. Um, and then last, I call it reinforcing uh, the, the local sense of deep rootedness. Now, this is something that I, I call it as an American, um, one of the things I love about this country and what I love about the English is that they have almost a visceral attachment to um, where they live, to um, their home, to the, to the land here in a way that Americans don't really feel. And I love that about this country. And I think that this local heritage uh, or this local listing sort of helps promote that. English people feel that they're part of this great long continuum um, of millennia, people living here for millennia which you don't get in America. And, um, and it's something that I think is, is really important in this country. And I think it's really something that should be cherished and, and we don't want to lose sight of that. And I think that part of this whole program, the local listing program will help um, promote that and make people really, like I said, feel their pride of place and, and really feel that sense of deep rootedness um, that they feel. So um, next, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the importance of the Historic Environmental Record, the HER, um, in its relationship to the local heritage list. Um, now, this is a screenshot of um, a record. If you go on to the Somerset HER um, website, you and you look up a particular record, this is what you will see in front of you. So what you will get is... Um, it, it, there will be a number that, that will tell you what the actual um, number is attached to that particular record. In this case, um, it's this shows um, beech trees, um, not a building. I purposely decided not to show you a building um, because we are looking at things other than just buildings. I'm trying to encourage people to look beyond just buildings. Um, there's a grid reference, um, usually a parish if it's known. And then in this case, um, um, the, a local listing um, has been um, put forward for this particular um, tree, this particular asset, heritage asset. And then there is um, details to tell you about this particular asset. Um, now, what is the HER? For those people who aren't really familiar with it, um, the HER is an archive um, that is um, housed at the Southwest Heritage Trust. Um, it's a database, a digital database. Um, it was built from the uh, primary resource material from the Somerset um, um, archives, the Somerset County archives, which are also housed at the Southwest Heritage Trust. Um, and these digital, um, this digital database has got tens of thousands of entries now, and it covers the whole spectrum of heritage. Um, it, it talks about, it, it's got archeological sites, it's got buildings and parks and wrecks and battlefields and all of those things. Um, so anything that has any heritage value um, is put onto the HER and it's a constantly growing and changing and morphing um, database. But it's a great um, point for um, going to for research. And, um, and if anyone, if you're giving advice to anyone um, about anything of a heritage nature, usually going to the HER um, is your first point to go to for information. Um, um, before you give out any, you know, giving out information to other people, or it's a place that you can um, direct people to go to. Um, here, just a few examples of the sorts of things that we have on the HER, um, a shipwreck, um, a public park in Taunton to the top right. You've got this World War II pillbox in the bottom right um, outside of Dunster. We've got lots of military installations um, which are listed. And then we have a um, uh, a building uh, called the Zigzag Building in Glastonbury, which is currently um, being um, um, repaired and brought back into to use. Um, but as you see, it's, it, it's a wide variety of different type of assets that we're looking for. So why is the HER important? 
for the local heritage list? Well, the HER records both the statutory listed buildings, the, you know, the grade one, grade two, star grade two, as well as scheduled monuments, as well as what we call non-designated assets, basically anything that's not a listed building or a scheduled monument. So anything on the local heritage list is also considered a non-designated asset. Um, but everything is all in one place, which is really great. So that so if you want to say, for example, um, look up something in your village and you want to know, you're thinking, oh, this might be good for putting up for um, local uh, local lists. You can actually go on the HER, see if you can find it on the HER and see if it's already designated. If it's already designated as a listed building or scheduled monument, then you won't be able to, to put it forward as a local heritage um, for the local heritage list. Um, anyway, it's the HER is where the local heritage list is now stored. Um, and also by having the local heritage list on the HER, it makes it really easy for us to regularly um, update it, maintain it. Um, it. We're very early days in terms of getting things onto the local heritage list. So with each passing month, you will see things added to it. Um, it will grow over time. Um, it's not static. Um, mostly we're going to be adding to, adding new, new um, um, assets onto it or we will be adding additional information to existing ones that we get. Or from time to time, we do have to remove things, things that have been, that have destro been destroyed or are no longer there. Luckily, that doesn't happen very often, but um, that is sometimes um, what we have to do. So the main thing is that the HER is really the go-to source for anyone who is dealing with um, heritage advice. And certainly it's where um, the planners go. Um, when they are assessing planning applications that come across their desk. Um, again, a few more examples of um, heritage assets that we would welcome um, to be put forward for local listing. Here you see a phone box in Bishop's Lydiard, um, a drinking fountain and lamp in the um, town of Street, and um, a terrace of houses um, also in Street. These are all um, perfect examples things that, that are great for the local heritage list. Now, um, we actually have two different historic environmental records for Somerset and Expo National Park. Um, there are many HERs throughout the country in lots of different districts. Some, some cover just small districts, some cover entire counties. Unfortunately, there is no standard um, HER format that's followed. Um, many people, uh, many of the the different HERs are either um, designed in-house by their own people. Other people go and buy bespoke software offline. Um, in this case, um, the Exmoor National Park um, has bought um, a software package that was that was developed for HERs, whereas um, the Somerset HER was developed in Bristol. Um, by their own people, and that's the one that Somerset now uses. So we do, they are actually two very separate entities. However, the, the two people who are running the HERs in, the, in both Exmoor and in Somerset um, have spent this last year working together very closely to make sure that there's as much overlap in terms of terminology used and you know, how they go about um, uploading information so that they can um, pass information back and forth between each other. But one thing that you will need to keep in mind when if you are going to um, nominate um, any asset um, for local listing is make sure that you know um, if you are within the boundary of Exmoor National Park or outside the boundary. Because if whatever it is that you're interested in nominating falls within the, the boundary lines, of Exmoor National Park, you need to um, you need to give the um, application to Exmoor National Park as a, and then if you're outside the boundaries, then any application that you put in or nomination that you put forward needs then to go to Somerset um, HER. This is all very clearly spelled out um, on the Southwest Heritage Trust website. Um, you, it, it, it will be very clear to you um, when you start to go through that process exactly how you go about doing it. Um, I'm just trying to cover the broad, the, give broad sweep right now, just to give you a general feel for what, what to expect. So you can use the HER to help you sort of inspire nominations. Um, if you're very excited about this project and you really want to um, nominate 
one or, or numerous things, but you're not really sure where to start or what exactly you want to do, um, you can actually go on to the, the, your local AGR and you can have a look at the sort of things that are already there. And that might give you some ideas of, of things that you can be looking for um, because you might be inspired. Say, for example, you'll say, oh, here's someone who has put forward a bunch of drain covers, decorative drain covers. Um, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe I'll go around my village and have a look and see if we have some pretty drain coverage that, that I think might be interesting um, for, for listing. Um, you, um, and, it, and it can and also help you um, to double check to make sure that something that perhaps you have thought might be interesting um, to nominate, you can go online onto the HR and see if it's already been put forward for nomination or if it's already been statutory listed. Because in, in, in that case, then the deed is already done and you don't, you know, you, you're on to a non-starter on that one. So then you need to go and think about something else. Um, but anyway, it's it's always a good um, first point uh, for starting is go to the HER first and see what's there. So if you want to do a search um, on the Somerset HER, um, this is a screenshot showing you um, I search page. So if you want to do a text, you know, there are two ways that you can search on the Somerset HER. You can either search under text or you can search via the map. I'm going to show you the text first. This is what you will see when you go onto the website. And um, you will see a search box at the top. Um, up, let's see if I can get the cursor there. There you go. Um, there's your search site. So you can either put in the, the name if you know what it's called. Um, or the type of, of, of asset it is, if you know, or you can search by the time period if you know its date, or um, if you know what parish it's in, you can search by parish. Um, in fact, Tom Sunley, who is the HER or has been the HER um, um, person at in Somerset, um, he said that if you are want to look for things that are already have already been put forward for the local heritage list your best bet is to search under parish. Um, so if you know the parish that the asset is in, then definitely type in parish under your search. Um, he also said, come to the bottom here, I put a little arrow on it. At the very bottom of this, of this um, page, you will see something that says limit search to local listed to locally listed areas. So if you tick that little box there, that says limit the search, it will only bring up those things that have um, already been put forward for local listing. So this, this is especially useful if you have in mind one or several things that you would like to um, to, to um, nominate, um, and you can go and see, has anyone already beat me to the punch? So that's the best way um, to go about that. Um, that's using the text search. You can also go on do a map search. So if you know it precisely where um, this asset is, and I, I should think you would know that, um, you can actually pull up the map. Um, and, and search that way. And all you have to do is um, find on the map precisely where it is that you're looking for. And here's here's a screenshot showing you, um, uh, I'm not even sure where this place is, but that doesn't really matter. What you see is that you see these, these um, green dotted lines. Well, anywhere you see a green dotted line, those are assets which have been put forward for nomination for the local heritage list. So anywhere, and it says over here, the local heritage lists are marked by green dotted lines. So anywhere a green dotted line is, that tells you that particular asset has already been put forward or has, has been um, accepted as um, uh, onto the local list. Um, green or blue hatch lines like this one here, um, that indicates a statutory listed. So that's either a grade one a grade two star or grade two um, building there. Um, and then monuments are marked in red. So there are quite a few monuments on this particular map marked out, all these, all these areas outlined in red. Um, so those are non-designated heritage assets. Um, so they're not, they're not Shedford monuments, they're not um, uh, listed buildings, um, but they are um, important enough to go on to the um, heritage listing, well, actually onto the, the um, historic environmental record um, because they do have historic value to somebody. All right, so that's that is, uh, the maps. Um, the X, this is a screenshot showing you what you see on the Exmoor historic environmental record. Um, I'm pretty sure you can only search um, via maps 
um, on theirs. They're, they may be changing it and updating it uh, um, eventually. They're a little bit behind us um, just because they're a smaller organization and don't have quite the manpower um, as Southwest Heritage Trust. Um, but they're they're moving along at a, at a good clip um, and they are um, working very hard to keep up um, with any um, nominations that come through uh, to them. This tends to be an overlay of different maps. And what they've done here is they've, it's quite clearly shown here. The different map layers are showing you monuments, um, scheduled monuments, listed buildings. What it doesn't show yet, and I'm pretty sure that if they haven't put it on yet, it will be showing up soon. There will be a new layer here that will show up that will say locally listed, um, a local listing, local heritage list. Um, the um, I'm not sure they have quite got that far yet, but that is coming um, soon. Um, but again, the, the overlay map is, is fairly self-explanatory. I don't want to get into all the weeds of all this because that's a whole webinar in its own right and how to go about um, using these. But there are um, some tutorials that you can follow on Southwest Heritage Trust website um, that will explain to you how these work and, and, and talk you through them. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the scope of local listing. Um, here is a footbridge um, in Cannington. I'm going to talk more about the bridges of Cannington a little bit later on. But again, a really good example of something that would um, qualify for um, going on to the local heritage list. So what are the basic requirements um, for inclusion on the list? Well, first of all, it has to obviously be within um, modern, modern Somerset um, and Exmoor National Park. And by modern Somerset, I mean, as you see from those the blue areas, the, those particular local planning authorities as they stand now, um, that's what we consider currently uh, modern Somerset. So whatever you want to nominate needs to fall within those boundary lines. Um, it cannot already be statutory listed as in a, a, a listed building or a scheduled monument. Um, and it must have be a heritage asset. It must have um, what they consider a heritage value. Um, things that are of very modern date, even though they may be particularly rare or um, distinctive design or a famous architect or any of those things, it won't cut the mustard, I'm afraid, unless it actually has some kind of heritage value. So um, a few very modern things have been um, put forward already, um, but those have been um, turned down just because there's no um, sort of heritage um, value associated with it just yet. So I think those sorts of things will have to be revisited several decades from now, and maybe 30 or 40 years from now, those things will find their way onto the list, but it's a little too early days for those right now. Again, a couple of pictures on this slide that show you good examples of the sorts of things that we're looking for for the, for the list. You've got um, finger post um, on the left-hand side. Anyone who lives in Somerset is well acquainted with these um, finger posts all over the county. They are um, quite, um, they're quite distinctive um, for this county. Um, and that's a perfect example of, of, of a, a an asset that would we would welcome to, to put onto the list. Um, bottom right corner, you can see an 18th century toll house. Um, again, not special enough to warrant um, national listing. So therefore it, it kind of missed the cut with historic England in that first round, but a perfect example of a locally important building that's in really good um, repair and um, is very important to the local community. So we'd love to see that sort of building um, brought forward and put onto the list. So as we were talking earlier, heritage asset is a very broad term, um, but in planning terms, um, planning um, regulations, they've given a very strict definition where they, they basically said that a heritage asset you know, is a building, a monument, a site, a place, an area or a landscape, which has heritage interests. And so these are things that um, we have to take into account when nominations are put forward in assessing whether or not we can move forward um, with that nomination. So each of these different, the, the building, monument, site, place, area, or landscape, I'll go into a little bit more detail um, so that you see the sorts of things that we're looking for and the sorts of 
questions we have to ask ourselves when making assessments of things that come forward. So for buildings, well, buildings can either be lived in or not lived in, um, but it, but these buildings that are nominated um, need to be, um, we feel, you know, they need to be looked after and cared for in order to retain their architectural or aesthetic value. Um, and so that's something that, that we would take into account, obviously, when we're looking at um, a, a nomination. In this case, the example that we show here is the art house from the early 1970s in Taunton. You know, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to, you have to distance yourself from the subjective view of things um, because a lot of these things you personally may not think um, are attractive or pretty or whatever, but it's not about what the, the subjective, we have to be much more objective about um, these decisions. So um, we need, if we look at, at monuments, monuments are um, usually ruined buildings or buildings in disrepair um, that are no longer lived in, um, but where people have lived or used in the past. And usually, um, you know, a typical example as you see here is a World War II gun emplacement. This one happens to be in Watch It. And although it's in disrepair and it's in a fairly ruinous state, um, it is still important to our local heritage and the local culture because it, it, it talks about or it, it defines a particular time in, in uh, a period of time um, in this country that was very important culturally. And, um, and this is sort of thing that's worth holding on to and saving and maintaining and not allowing it to disappear altogether or be destroyed. Um, under sites, mostly sites tend to deal with archaeological sites. Um, in this case, we're looking at a, um, an aerial view of a deserted village. There are actually are quite a few deserted villages around Somerset. In fact, there's one just on the outside of um, Luxborough called Clicket. Um, but these are places that um, hold evidence of past human activity and where people did, used to live and, and there used to be communities. Um, and again, these areas are important to the local community. So a lot of people in the surrounding areas um, are descendants of people perhaps who lived um, in these earlier communities. So it's important that again, that we preserve these and protect these so they don't, they don't end up being covered up by development. Under place or area, this is a little bit more esoteric. Um, in this particular example, we're showing the site of the old site of where the gallows used to be for Taunton on the edge of Taunton in what's now, um, I think, Troll. Um, and it's a bit gruesome, but on the other hand, it's really quite important, um, this particular site. Obviously important enough for the locals to have put up a monument to it um, with a plaque which describes what that site represented to people back in the 19th century and earlier. I'm not quite sure when the gallows first were put up, but I know that they were taken down around in the, in the early 1800s. Um, but it was important enough historically to the people who lived in that area that they wanted to commemorate it with this marker. So again, this is a good example of something that we would like to put forward for the local listing because um, it, it, it speaks to an earlier time and what went on in, in that area at that time. And we don't want to lose sight of that. Um, and then lastly, there's the landscape. Um, mostly um, these are man-made. Um, we're looking at things like, um, in this case, the crematorium uh, garden, or at least a portion of, a portion of the crematorium garden um, in Taunton, but um, a lot of the large estates around um, Somerset um, the rural estates have got parkland um, and ornamental gardens. Um, so these are all things too that we feel are worth trying to give some level of protection to because they have not um, been um, previously protected um, with any of the other um, planning rules and regulations that have come, come so far. Now, in addition to um, heritage assets, we also consider the heritage interest. Um, because um, in the planning context, um, the heritage interests can be broken down into either um, you know, an archeological interest, an architectural interest, an artistic interest or historic interest. So a few examples of, of how that's represented is here under archeological in that top right corner, you can see um, some medieval um, fish weirs. 
um, in Blue Anchor, which is sort of sandwiched between Dunster Beach and um, Watchet um, on the north coast of Somerset. Um, and this is a really good example of fish weirs of that time period. Um, I don't think they're used anymore. Um, I don't know, but the um, but that's the sort of um, archaeological evidence, evidential value that planners would use when making assessments um, if, if people want to make changes or do something that might interfere with the integrity of that archaeological site. Um, now, for architectural interests, we're mainly looking, or the planners are looking at design, decoration, and craftsmanship. If you look in this second picture down on the right, showing the Jalalabad barracks in Taunton, you can see some really lovely um, design elements on this building in terms of using colored brick, gauged brick, um, just the craftsmanship and the design and decoration are all you know, top notch. So these are all things that um, certainly play into um, making a building like this um, worthwhile of, of protection under the, um, the local heritage listing scheme. Um, under artistic, if you look to the left, there's um, public sculpture. There's quite a bit of public sculpture around, around Somerset. Um, dating to the early 1960s, it's called agriculture. I think it's outside the, um, the um, county offices in Taunton now. Um, and, um, you know, it may not be your cup of tea in terms of your own personal taste in public artwork, but it is of a time period and, um, and it certainly speaks to that particular time. And, <laughs> excuse me, the, um, and again, something that would, would definitely qualify for going on to the local list. <clears throat> um, the third picture down on the right is really interesting. And that's a close up of actually a, a, of a terracotta vent in a building in Minehead. Um, we don't get craftsmanship like that anymore. I, I don't know of any modern building that goes to that level of decoration in its vents, <clears throat> but um, is a beautiful bit of craftsmanship. I mean, and that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. Um, sometimes it's a small detail that can be overlooked so easily. Um, but if we we often take these small things for granted, but we have to ask ourselves if that disappeared, you know, would we miss it? And then I think most people would say yes, they would. So again, this is the sort of thing we're looking for to get listed so we can get it protected. Um, and then the last one is the historic interest. And this is where um, assets have some kind of a link to the past. Usually it's through um, uh, famous people or a famous event, um, or it could be a, have communal or social value, say um, a meeting house or um, some kind of a, um, a house of worship of some sort. Um, and so the bottom right picture, that's just um, part of the blue plaque scheme, um, which is showing that someone um, of local importance um, lived, worked, or died there. So let's talk about a few more examples, sorts of things. I know that um, um, this particular um, picture here is it's quite a nice picture. This are um, the uh, Paternison houses, experimental houses that were date to about 1925. It was post World War I housing. Um, I don't really know um, how many of these were actually built, um, but there are about five or six that have um, that have um, survived in, in pretty good condition and they're they're being looked after now. But surprisingly, actually, they haven't been statutory listed um, because they are really quite rare. Um, or maybe there are more outside of Somerset that we're just, I'm, I'm just not aware of, um, which is why perhaps they didn't make the, the grade in terms of um, national listing. But um, anyway, they are definitely going on to um, the local heritage list. And again, this is the sort of thing that we're looking for. I mean, a lot of people can't get excited about corrugated iron, but there are a few people out there who are excited about corrugated iron. And, um, and this is right up their alleyway. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, please put it forward. Um, now, this again, I'm just gonna show you a broad variety of different things to try and um, encourage you to look widely around you um, in your own location to see what might um, be of interest to you locally. I, I think the main thing I'm saying to people in trying to encourage them to step up and promote their own 
personal local heritage where they live and to nominate things is um, to ask yourself when you cast a critical eye around your location, if if that or that or that, whatever it might be that you see as you're walking down your street or, or past the pub or whatever, you ask yourself, I'm so used to seeing this all day, every day. If that disappeared tomorrow, would I miss it? And if the answer is yes, you would miss it. Well, then maybe you need to think, hmm, okay, what do I need to do to see that it's protected? Um, so you really need to start casting your critical eye because I think a lot of us just take for granted what we see around us. We never think about the what if, what if that disappeared? What if a developer comes in and decides he wants to build five would-be homes in that field? You know, what will that mean to me or whatever it might be? I'm not saying that development is bad. I'm not saying that we don't need extra housing. Um, we absolutely do need all those things. Um, but I think that we just need to be very careful that um, in the rush of progress, because I've seen this, unfortunately, in America for many years, um, where there are no planning, um, any kind of planning um, restrictions, um, huge swathes of historic um, buildings and historic um, assets have completely been wiped off the face of the earth in, in the United States. Um, and so it's, it's important that, you know, if these things are important to you, that you, you know, step up now and say, you know, oi, I really want to protect that um, and see if we can't make it uh, hang around a bit longer, certainly for some future generations. So here are just some more examples of the sort of things that we're looking at or that people are putting forward. On the top left, you see a World War II um, airfield gun emplacement. Um, and then in the middle is a 1962 ROC observation post. What you can't see is underneath um, the grass is a, a Cold War um, nuclear bomb shelter. Um, it's still there. It's pretty grim, grim, grim in there, pretty gruesome. Um, it still has its, its um, interior fittings with all rusted, rusted bunks and all kinds of kind of scary stuff. Um, but it may not be beautiful, but on the other hand, it's really important because it speaks to that particular time um, in our history. And, um, and I think it's important for future generations to be able to see that this is, this is the way people lived and, and, and what they feared and what they had to be dealing with back during that time period. Um, so that one is up for listing. To the top right, corner. That's actually a style made of two big slabs of lias. I have to admit that's the only style of that sort. I've seen many styles in this county. I've never seen one quite like that. Um, it's it's unusual and it's fantastic. And that's just the sort of thing that we're looking for to protect because um, I think it's really quite splendid. Um, the bottom left corner um, is one, uh, an example of a, a mid 19th century lime kiln. Um, you will see these lime kilns all over the all over the county. Um, as you all well know, um, most of the all of the settlements throughout the county were originally um, built using uh, locally. Most of them were locally quarried stone. Um, where there wasn't stone, then they then they built um, um, when they were making bricks, and they were built with brick. They would make bricks, but these lime kilns obviously then were put up around where um, the buildings were going up because they needed to, to burn and slake their own lime um, for their mortar. Um, so, but these lime kilns, again, talk to the to that particular period in history and to the, um, the building heritage of those areas. So we're hoping to um, try and identify these and get these on the list as well. Um, the middle bottom picture is looking at um, a bit of very early um, infrastructure. Um, it's a late 18th century uh, bridge. Um, Aller Moor, I'm not sure where Aller Moor is. It looks like, judging by how flat it is, that that's down in the Somerset levels. Um, and as most people know, back um, in prehistoric times, um, all, a lot of this area was um, flooded. And over the, over the decades and over the centuries, um, ditches have, and canals have been built to drain the land, to make it habitable and arable land for growing crops and having um, uh, animals on it. And so these very early bridges crossing these ditches and creeks and canals, um, again, are very important. And um, we don't want to lose them and we want to make sure that they get on the list as well. And then on the bottom right is an example of some early um, 19th century bollards. 
um, in Taunton. And all I can say about that is that they don't make bollards like that anymore. Um, our modern bollards, plastic that are orange and white, aren't a patch on these lovely um, early ones. So we're hoping that ones like that um, are preserved for future generations. And the way to do that is to try and get them onto the list. Um, on the left-hand side, early 1970s, Philip King sculpture. He was commissioned by the um, owners of the um, Clark's factory um, to create several sculptures, um, which are now in street. And the people of street are very keen to hold on to these. Um, so again, these have been around long enough. They're about 50 years now um, that they do warrant some heritage um, um, value. Um, so these um, public sculptures are also being put forward. Um, the middle picture there shows you um, a Jubilee lamp. I think that was from one of the Queen Victoria's Jubilee years. Um, and again, um, street furniture is another place that we're looking to um, add to our list. This is a really good example. Um, this one happens to be in Shepton Beecham. Um, the third lot of pictures um, from the left, Swain's Jump Bridgestone. I think Swain's Jump, I don't know a whole lot about it. I'm, I'm, I think it's a local legend, um, something about somebody leaping across a river or leaping, doing some major leap. I don't know, It's um, but it is a local legend, um, which has been commemorated by a stone. Um, and the people there locally um, love this legend, love this story, love this stone. And so um, they are putting forward um, this um, for the localists. And I do think that it um, would probably meet enough of the criteria to um, get onto the list. Um, on the far right, you see a series of three, um, what's called highway heritage. These are actually um, drain covers. Um, they're all basically Somerset County Council, as you can see from the bottom one. I think the two um, pictures above that one um, are earlier iterations of um, Somerset County Council. I'm not sure, um, maybe Somerset Local, whatever the B stands for, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, the um, but these drain covers are decorative and interesting, um, tell a story um, about um, infrastructure and utilities um, within the county. So again, this is the sort of thing that we're looking for um, to put forward. So let's talk a little bit about some of the places rather than the sort of things that I've been talking about up until now. Um, this is a um, mill pond, um, uh, an early to mid century, 19th century mill pond um, in Cheddar Gorge. And um, it, as you see now, it's a bit, it looks like it's been developed into a park. I personally have not been to this site, um, but this is sort of place that we're looking to get onto the list because it's not statutory listed in any way, shape or form. It doesn't really have any legal protection against development. Um, and so we're very keen to have spaces and places like this um, nominated to go onto the list. Um, here outside of street, I don't know how many people have gone through this intersection on the edge of street um, and passed this field and actually knew that, that field is actually quite important in, in English history. Marshall's Elm supposedly was the site of the very first skirmish of the English Civil War, um, which actually is kind of important if you're a historian and if you, especially military history, um, that's an, actually quite an important spot. And the last thing you want is for a developer to come here, come in there and plonk a, a petrol station down in the middle of it um, or a Wawa or something like that. Oh, sorry, you don't have that in this country. Um, whatever your whatever your um, sort of fast food or well, Marks and Spencer is say fast food place. Um, so it's um, this is a sort of place that we are looking for that have um, historic value. Um, and a connection to the past, but which aren't perhaps, you wouldn't necessarily know that just driving past it. So this is why we really are relying on um, members of the public and people within local communities to step up and say, hey, I know that, that this particular site, so-and-so happened and, and really needs to be protected. So again, this is the sort of thing that we would love to hear from you um, and to put forward and make sure it gets on the list so that the planners moving forward when planning applications come through will know, ah, okay, this is important. Um, another example here in Glastonbury, 
Um, the actual tour itself, well, the building, the remains on the top of the tour, um, that is statutory listed as owned by Historic England um, or English Heritage. But the what they call the the lynchets, which are which is the 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 hillocks that lead up to it, um, the the funny sort of terracing, um, those are not protected. Um, and um, so this has now been put forward as something that could be quite um, useful if we can go ahead and get it get it on the list. Because I mean, I know that English Heritage owns it, and maintains, and looks after it, and I think it's unlikely that they would say put a funicular or something up there to allow people easy access up and down that steep hill. But I personally walked up that hill not many weeks ago and it's hard, it's not easy. Um, it, it's challenging, um, but putting in some kind of a modern uh, way of uh, getting people up that hill easily um, would actually damage the view and would damage the whole look of the place. So we wouldn't want to try and um, give it some a little bit more level of protection than what it's got what it's got now. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the oddities that we're coming across that people are putting forward and how we've discussed how that how how we're going to get these listed. Um, so many people may recognize Humphrey the camel um, who you can see as you drive past um, Bridgewater on the M5. You can see him better heading south on the M5 rather than heading north. I did see him the other day when I was driving back from Heathrow. Um, and he's very much there still peering over his hedge. Um, but Humphrey was put forward as um, one of um, the, um, as something for, for local heritage lists. And I'm pretty sure he will probably go through. So some of the other things that have come forward um, has been against a bit of public art in the top left corner here. Um, in um, Kilmerston, the people of Kilmerston um, are convinced that their hill in their village or outside their village um, is the hill that um, is at the center of the Jack and Jill um, nursery rhyme. I don't know if there's any way to prove that, um, but they believe it and um, they're proud of that and they commission this public artwork um, to talk about it and to let other people know um, that that's what went on here. Um, and so again, they're very proud of this and they have put this forward as something that they would like to see protected. Um, the um, the sign below it, the, the early direction sign, and then the one to the, in the center picture, more direction signs, um, both at AA1 and then just a county one. Um, again, these all hark back to early motoring history. Um, and um, they don't make signs like this anymore, as we well know. Um, and um, people are very keen to um, maintain them and keep them and not lose them. Um, so they they have been put forward um, and they're they're part of what we would call street furniture. Then on the far right hand side, it's a Jubilee stone. Um, this one obviously set up for um, our, the um, recently passed queen um, because the first one um, was um, in 1977. I think that must have been her first Jubilee. Um, but anyway, and they have have commented right the way up to the present day. Um, and again, the local people of Brent Knoll want to make sure that this Jubilee stone uh, or beacon actually stays um, for future generations. So again, it's not protected in any way, shape or form at the moment, but hopefully if we can get it onto the local list, um, that will give it some level of protection. Um, we have a little bit of a interesting problem when people put forward things on wheels. Because obviously, if you can move something, um, as soon as it's moved from its site, it loses its context. And um, so in these in these three cases that I'm going to show here, the decision was taken um, that actually we can advance this um, onto the list because although they may be on wheels, they aren't going anywhere. Um, this particular one on the left is an old um, shepherd's hut. It's a really good example of its style and of its time. It is on wheels, but it is now a static display at the Somerset Rural Life Museum in Glastonbury. So because it is a static display and it's not going anywhere, um, that one will um, probably make it onto the local list. The central one is called the Cane of Peace in, in nine head or nin head. Um, it um, is uh, an old plow 
Again, it's on wheels, but it's a static display now. It's not going anywhere. So that one will probably also be promoted to the list. And then again, here is Humphrey the camel. This obviously is a picture taken from a moving car heading north. You can't see it as well heading north. Like I said, you're better off seeing him when you're heading south. Um, he actually is on wheels, but that's only because once a year, the farmer rolls him into his barn and repaints him and then rolls him back out again. So um, he really isn't going anywhere. Um, and um, so I think the decision is being taken that he probably will go onto the list. He's become quite the local landmark. Um, so in, in assessing these nominations that come forward, the first thing that the um, assessment panel will do is determine, um, you know, is it does it does this particular asset have either archaeological, architectural, artistic, or historic um, value? And so long as it ticks one of those boxes, it then moves forward onto what we call the selection themes or the selection criteria. And in order to get onto the list, um, any asset has to have only one of the criteria, only has to meet one of the criteria in order to qualify for going onto the list. Many of them have got more than just one of the criteria, um, but it's so long as it has one strong, uh, meets one of, the, one, one of the criteria strongly, that is enough for it to get onto the list. So the bar is not really high, um, but, it, but it, you know, there is a certain bar that has to be met. Um, the picture here is just showing um, what's called the Cricket Cross. Um, it's a nice um, Celtic cross that seems to be a, a marker for the village of um, cricket. I'm not sure where cricket is, but anyway, somewhere in the county. So I'm going to quickly go through and just show you an example of each of the different types of criteria, what we consider, what we would consider a strong contender under that particular criteria. The first one we're going to look at is evidential value. Now, this is a lamp standard. Um, in Witherwind, which is um, a, a section of Troll outside of Taunton. And it's a really good example of a completed, a complete cast iron gas lamp. Um, and it's, it's, it's got the stamp of the foundry on it um, with the name. Um, but what makes this so special, not only is it that it's in such good repair, um, and, it, and that in itself is rare, but that there's a we have a really good history of the foundry itself, which was based in Froome. And we not only know a lot about the foundry, we actually have a, an archive from the foundry actually in the Somerset County um, archives. So there is a good chance that this, that this exact um, um, gas standard, lamp standard, um, can actually be traced through the archive um, the primary through primary research, and we can actually probably even find um, not only you know when it was ordered, but you know when it was made, when it was installed, how much was paid for it, all of that, and that in itself is unusual. Um, so that's why it gets high marks for its evidential value, um, and it also gets fairly high marks because it's it's rare in that it's so complete and and not damaged. Um, so in terms of age, this is an example of um, an asset um, nominated that um, would rank high um, under age. Uh, we don't know, we couldn't get on the inside, we don't know what the inside is like. Um, the exterior though, um, is a very good example in terms of its roof, its, its chimney stacks, its gable ends, um, the porch, all of that. This all rings very true for these three periods of building. Um, and it's um, and, and although it does have replacement windows, unfortunately, um, you will find that a lot now. Um, the rest of the architectural elements on the house um, are really good examples of their time period. We also know that um, it was run as a local pub for 200 years. So um, not only does it have strong architectural elements or significance, um, even though we don't even we don't know how much of the interior has survived, um, it's it is important for for those reasons, but also it's important in terms of the social history of the village. Um, so that kind of ranked high in in two areas. Um, under rarity, this is a good example of something that, that is strong in the rarity um, uh, criteria, and this is a what remains of a railway viaduct um, in Baffleton. 
and um, I assume that the rails, um, the main bit of the railway was ripped out by Dr. Beeching all those years ago. Um, but the um, pillars, the viaduct pillars still remain. And the local people um, are very fond of these. And it's currently under threat. Um, and because it represents, you know, the last you know, trace of the line that used to run from Barnstable to Taunton, the local people are really keen that these these remain um, as a testament to that to that line. Maybe they're hoping it will get rebuilt again. I don't know, but the um, but it, this one has definitely been put forward. It actually, is a sense of some urgency um, so that um, it gets some level of protection in the hopes that it won't be um, taken down by um, whoever owns the land now. All right, let's see. Um, historical Association. Um, this one happens to be the Nether Stowey Library. It was originally built as their school. Um, it's important because of its um, links to uh, historical figures. In this case, Thomas Poole, who was a local philanthropist um, who lived in Nether Stowey or in the, in the immediate um, region. He actually was also a benefactor of, of the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, and he worked with uh, a well-known um, local architect at the time named Richard C Caver, um, who actually built the school. This is one of the earliest public school buildings built in the country. Um, and for that reason, um, the, we've got this very strong historical association um, with these people. It's also ranked quite highly under um, social, um, sort of the social value. Um, because of um, the social history that's involved with this building. Um, distinctive design, here we go. This is a better view of Glastonbury Tour and of the Lynchets. Um, they don't really know why the Lynchets are there. They, people, the, the, the assumption really is that it was a path to the top. Um, they know it's not geological formation because many of the um, excavations have been done in, in various places around. Um, and there's no evidence that this was geological. This is definitely man-made. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it is very distinctive in its design. Um, it's unusual and everyone recognizes it from a great distance. So um, this one ranked very high on its distinctive design um, criteria. Um, then we have social and communal value. This is um, a good example. It's a series. This is just one of several um, um, grand buildings, um, what they call first-class mansion houses, um, that were built between um, the, well, from the, from the Regency to the Edwardian period, or really early modern um, period. And what it does, it, it shows the development of um, uh, the evolution of suburban housing, residential housing. Um, and that it's very interesting in how this relates to all those other buildings and you can actually see a continuum. So that's why this gets high ranking for social and communal value because it actually helps um, in being able to um, inform people um, and explain or show how um, suburban housing developed over the centuries, uh, but mostly during that particular time period. Um, and then we've got group value. Um, you may remember I showed an earlier footbridge. I think it's the picture um, it's here up to the, on the left. That was the first picture I, I showed you. Um, this is the footbridge across in the village of Cannington. Cannington is unusual in that it's got three bridges that cross its river. There is also a ford. Um, but what's interesting is that these three bridges illustrate three different time periods, um, which shows the um, progression of bridge design and construction technology. Um, and what's interesting, you can either stand the bridge at the eastern side or the bridge on the western end and look back and you can see all three bridges. And that's really unusual. Um, and that's why these were put together as a um, group, as, as ranked very high as a group value because as a group of three different bridges and then a fourth crossing, um, it's, it, it's um, very interesting um, that they can all be grouped together um, and illustrate how um, how bridge design and construction changed over time. And then lastly is the um, what we call collective value. That's the eighth um, criteria that, that, that it, it could fall under, any of your, your um, assets could fall under. And the collective value 
it's similar to the group value, but it's it's a little bit different. In this case, you're looking at a picture of a finger post. Um, again, I had spoken earlier about finger posts that all of you, I'm sure, are aware of finger posts all over all over the county. Um, but um, it's really important that um, all of these collectively, because they're 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 at least 1,200 have been documented. There probably be more than that. I don't think anyone has yet put together sort of a full gazetteer of all of them that they know of. But but um, I know we have a, at least a list of, a, of at least about 1,200 of them. And as you know, they don't make them like this anymore. And, um, and it's, the county does not have a lot of money they um, for maintaining them. They will. They do have some money if one gets knocked over to maybe put it back up. Um, but in terms of maintaining them, it's really down to volunteers now um, to look after them, local volunteers. Um, but again, this ranked very highly under collective value because what we can do is we can kind of hoover up all of these um, like um, assets because they're all finger posts. They might have slightly different designs over the decades that they were manufactured, but they all collectively um, are finger posts and are important. So. Um, the the collective value is for these items they're numerous items but they're all spread out over a large geographical area as opposed to a group value which um, like the bridges that i just spoke about earlier you can see all of them in one place another example a good group value would be um, say a collection of different farm buildings around a farmstead again that would be um, something that could be done as a, a collective value um, or um, a row of townhouses you know, in a, in a town, um, they're all the same design, um, but they're all in good condition, but they all um, are um, together. So rather than have 15 different um, uh, assets, it would be put together as one group asset of 15 houses or whatever it might be. So that's kind of how we're, we're, we're trying to approach this. Um, so as you can see, any of any of those eight criteria, so long as whatever you're nominating falls within one of those eight criteria, then there's a good chance that it will, it will go make it onto the local list. Um, now, to finish off, I just want to talk very briefly about how you actually nominate an asset. Um, all the information that you need about how to do it is actually found on the Southwest Heritage Trust website. Um, but very briefly, there are four ways that you can nominate an asset. The first, um, and all of these are done, well, the first three are actually done um, by online. Um, the first one is um, the Know Your Place interactive website. Um, if you go onto the local heritage list, there will be an embedded link that will take you straight there and you can nominate directly onto that website. Um, the second way of going about it is to download um, a form from the Southwest Heritage um, 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 he uh, website. And um, that will, you can print out a form and fill it in um, and send it in, or, or you can fill it out online and send it back in. Um, if you um, have got multiple um, assets that you would like to put forward, then you can get in touch with us at the, the um, information that we have here that, and request a spreadsheet. Um, there are several um, amenity societies and civic societies um, who have already, over the years, pulled together a, a list of their own. Um, and so this would be very helpful to them because they can just um, um, download the spreadsheet or get a spreadsheet and then they can fill out the spreadsheet and then send it in to us. Um, and that will be the easiest way, way for them. And then for those people, though, who um, are not particularly computer savvy, um, they can actually just scribble on the back of a postcard and mail it into us uh, as much information as they can 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 give us. Um, obviously, the most amount of information that we can get at the outset is the most helpful to us. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, at Southwest Heritage Trust, we don't have the manpower and the um, and the money to put somebody full time onto this. So we are asking uh, members of the public. Um, and interested parties, people who wish to nominate something to try as best as they possibly can, do as much of the research themselves um, that they give to us. And then, um, the, because the more information they give to us, the less than that we need to do. Um, so anyway, I will leave you with that and just encourage you to go onto the Southwest Heritage Trust uh, website. 
um, all the information that you could possibly want or know um, <laughs> or think you will need, um, you will find there. Um, all right, I'm gonna hand back over to Lizzie, I think now. Well, I think it must be a relief for you, Mary, to have to stop talking for a while. I'm sure you're exhausted after all that. So much information. Uh, anybody who's been listening, please don't forget, if you want to ask some questions, now is the opportunity. Just type them into the, uh, the chat button and I can go through them and read them out to Mary. But I, I mean, I, I find that uh, lecture particularly fascinating. Um, I, I'm quite quite interested in the process of of listening um i did a nomination to the local list and i did it through the know your place website because i found it just easier really um and uh, the nice thing about the know your place website is it's um it's just quite fun to play with you get layers of maps and uh, things like that so mary Got your breath back more or less now. Yeah, I no, hope. I'm I'm fine. You know me, good, I don't good. have any trouble talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to talk. One of the things that fascinates me about any listing process is the things that you choose to list are chosen because you feel that it reflects your particular sort of history. So it's quite important what we choose to to try to protect, uh, right. to, um, I don't know, uh, propagate our, our history and the mm -hmm. stories that they tell. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was doing my PhD, I, I found that fascinating that initially when this thing started, they were really just trying to protect things they saw as quality buildings, which really meant uh, just big manor houses, castles, pretty well anything that was just made of stone. And of course, this sort of attitude has changed over time. And now we found ourselves, actually, we're interested in different sorts of histories rather than just the great and the good. Yes. So... So I think the local listing is particularly good example of telling personal stories in history. And that's why it's important to just have these little aid memoirs, really, isn't it? To yes, remind absolutely. ourselves of, of what what has gone before mm -hmm, and what we mm -hmm. can learn from that. Absolutely. The important thing about history. So we've got some good questions coming through here. Um, somebody says they were surprised to hear that there was no protection for historic buildings and sites in the USA. Is that likely to change in the future? Well, there is some, um, but it's, um, I, I, in case I gave a bit of a blanket, blanket um, comment on that. It's, there is some protection, but it's um, very, it's minimal and it varies greatly from place to place. You will find um, you've got more protection in the more urban areas that were early, er, that were settled early by the English <laughs> um, and the Europeans. So the, the, the Northeastern states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, those sorts of New York, um, and down to Virginia, pretty much. Um, these were all the earliest places that were settled by the English and by other Europeans. They obviously had the earliest and the oldest settlements. Um, but a lot of the, if you move further south, down the south with all the big plantation houses and all of that, um, a lot of the beautiful um, plantation houses built in the 18th century and 19th century um, have long gone. Um, they were torn down and they put up housing estates or strip malls or something awful. Um, it because is the way the planning, everywhere. Yeah, and, yeah, and I mean, I, I actually saw it out in the Middle East as well. I've done some work out yeah, in the Middle East. It is the and, way. And a lot of their vernacular architecture has completely disappeared. I know it's um, what they call the big yellow taxi syndrome. You uh, don't yes. know what you've got till it's got gone. To go, absolutely. We love doing it. She knew what she was talking about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so question here, after nominating a site, will I be notified if the nomination has been successful or unsuccessful? And if so, um, what will be the time frame for that? Ah, OK, so um, you... Um, we endeavor to let people know, um, like I said, we are, it's basically getting down to a one man band now <laughs> that this one year project has come to a close. So basically it's going to fall to Nick, who is our, um, 
our conservation officer, um, he will endeavor to reach out to those people, um, for those people who we do have a contact for, um, who've either put forward the nomination or who own um, um, a building or an asset that has been nominated sort of on their behalf. Um, the, the idea is that we will reach out to you to say yes um, or no. Um, but what we what you can do is that as you um, once you have put in your nomination, you can actually follow the progress online. If you go on to the HER, um, you can find whatever it is that you've nominated, because um, as soon as that nomination comes in, it gets entered onto the HER um, and then it will say, um, you know, um, I can't remember what there are like four or five different um, um, different terms that are used, but they basically, um, you know, nominated, uh, pending, um, or accepted or declined. Um, so you can go on and have a look um, to see where you are in that process. Um, what happens is that at the moment, because we've only had three, well, soon to be three assessment meetings, um, because we have kind of a big backlog to clear, um, the idea is that probably the assessment panel will meet we're hoping two to three times a year um, and to go through the nominations that have been put forward over a three to four month time period. So we're hoping that, you know, certainly within six months between when you nominate, you will have an answer, a uh, yes yeah. or no answer. Yeah. But it, it, it really just depends on being able to get everybody together. The assessment panel is made up of about between eight and 12 people. And you can well appreciate getting eight to 12 people around a table all at the same time in the same place is very challenging. Um, we have managed to do it now within this last year, we have managed to get people around the table three times. Um, so we're very proud of that, um, but it has not been easy. Um, but like I said, we are endeavoring um, to meet at least twice a year, if not three times a year. And so we have quite, um, there's, there's a good selection of people in the assessment panel, isn't there? Yes, uh, there is. It's pretty broad. We've got conservation, because I'm saying we, because I sit on it as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, but we, we, there's conservation officers, um, people like myself who have a particular interest in listing. Who else mm -hmm. is there? Oh, um, we've got some history people. Archaeologists. Um, Engineers, people who are interested yes. in industrial archaeology. Of course. Um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so a very broad mixture mm -hmm. from all sorts of areas of Somerset mm -hmm. with different points of view. So yes. it, is quite, it is quite an interesting and enjoyable experience, actually. Well, absolutely. Yeah, everyone has something different to bring to the table at these discussions. And so it is, it's, it, is, um, it is really, it makes a really good discussion. Um, everyone's very tired at the end of the day. We managed to get through about, we can manage between 30 and 40 nominations in a sitting. And it takes about five hours um, to get through 30 to 40 nominations. So it's, it's, it's hard on the brain cells, <laughs> but you know, it's also very, very worthwhile. Um, I think that initially you know, we have a lot to go on. Things will start to slow down once we clear our backlog. Um, but you know, we've got we're starting out, we've already got 1,300 nominations that we're trying to put forward and to get ratified. Um, of those 1,300 um, nominations, about 1,100 of those came from what we call legacy, um, um, from, from what we call legacy um, assets. And these are things that were gleaned from earlier conservation area appraisals, from um, neighborhood um, what were they called? A uh, village design statements and neighborhood plans. And a few were pulled out of Pevsner. And then a few actually were declined listings. Those, uh, those um, things that um, Historic England said didn't quite make the grade. So um, I would say all total of the, of the, of the 1300 things we've had nominated, I'm just looking at my numbers here, about 1100 were legacy and then about another 260, 270 were from um, um, members of the public and from partners um, or people within like SANS or, or SIAS, some of those um, heritage societies. Um, so that's just our starting point is 1300, um, you know, and we're expecting, you know, as word spreads and as we encourage more people to get involved, um, we're hoping that that number will go up, obviously. 
So um, somebody would like to know, uh, does the building owner, uh, where relevant, need to be consulted or uh, would they need to give their permission for nomination? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, so long as you know, a, a photograph is taken from public land and not, you can't trespass onto someone's private property to take a picture of it. Um, if it's deemed worthy of going onto the local heritage list, because there are no um, rules and regulations that legally that are attached to the listing, um, we don't need to be asking their permission. Um, if people, if, if someone, for example, if a homeowner's building a uh, home does get listed and they're not happy about it, they are, there is a, a mechanism by which they can um, object and write to the council. And that's all in the, um, on the website. But, um, but because there are no um, rules or regulations attached to actually a, a local listing designation, um, I think most people um, would not be concerned about it. Yeah. But yes, but there is a there is a mechanism by which you can, but you have to you have to give a pretty good reason why you don't think it should be listed. Um, and you may have yeah. a hard time making that making that argument um, to <laughs> planning officers. <laughs> OK, now we have another question here. Um, you, you were talking about that you wouldn't want to list buildings that were too new. Mm -hmm. And you had an example of 1972 as a building. Yeah. What would you be the cutoff point, do you think? think yeah. Oh, well, good question. And again, it's hard. Um, and I don't know, Lizzie, if you want to, 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 to move in on that, because I will say, you know, the 1970s building got through. That's 50 years. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. I think sort of 30 years at the moment. Yeah, there is a 30-year rule, of, actually. You know, there's yeah. sort of a 30-year kind of rule. It's a bit yeah. unspoken. I think that's kind of yeah. the guidelines that Historic yeah. England gave us. They, they, they won't look at anything that's uh, younger than 30 years. Younger than years, about 30 years. Technically, um, yeah. And I will say someone but, did put forward a building, an extension to a school in Wells. And it was a mm. beautiful modern extension. Mm. Um um, to this this school, private school um, and it was a famous architect it was beautifully done everything about it was lovely but it, it was only like 10 years old yeah so, yeah um, yeah when they say come back yeah I think it's the idea is that you need a certain distance to yeah. be able to see it objectively yes, yes. And, and it has and to have that heritage yeah like mm. they say it needs to yeah. have that element of heritage attached to it Absolutely. And our last question, person in Oxfordshire would like to know, is there a national list of HERs that he could search in Oxfordshire? Do you know, uh, Mary? Um, I should think, well, I don't know precisely for Oxfordshire, but I'm pretty sure that if you Google um, Oxfordshire or Oxford HER, something will pop up um, or type in rather than HER in all caps, you might want to type in um, historic environmental record um, and um, but Oxfordshire historic environmental record um, I'm sorry I can't tell you off the top of my head um, I suspect that there probably is one um, and I'm pretty sure that I don't think Oxfordshire is um, one of the 22 in this pilot project but they may already have one may already have a local heritage list um, but sorry about that I wish I could answer that um, better. But I would definitely say um, do a search under Oxfordshire Historic Environmental Record. And if, if one does exist, it will pop up. I'd be surprised if there wasn't one. Put it mm -hmm. that way. Okay. I think that's probably that's yeah. finished. We've gone on quite a long time, but nonetheless, it was um, really, well, very riveting for me. And I'm hoping that the, I'm sure the audience would have loved it very much indeed. So <laughs> anybody out there, get on the, uh, get on the internet and, and start nominating buildings and uh, artifacts and what they call them now heritage, heritage assets, assets. <laughs> you gotta get your heritage assets listed <laughs> thank you very much mary and um, i'm sure we all enjoyed it very much indeed well so, thank you lizzie 
That's a pleasure. Uh, we have some further webinars coming up. On the 24th of November, we have China Comes to Wells by Oliver Kent. And um, Oliver will be talking about a particularly fascinating collection of pottery, which was excavated at Wells Museum a few years ago. And uh, anybody who knows Ollie will know that he is absolutely brilliant at ceramics. Um, you get to have a month off in December, but to make up for it, we've got two webinars in January. On the 12th of January, David Dawson will run his postponed Somerset Chapels webinar. And later in the month, David Victor will talk about an aspect of local history. The newly formed Sands family membership will be running a Halloween tour. This is a live event on, of course, the 31st of October. If you need to find out more about that, ring the Sands office. And on the 12th of November, Steve Parker will be doing his fungi foray. So I think they're off to Rodney Stoke to start looking for fungus. So all details of webinars and live events is on the SANS Facebook page and particularly uh, for particular details on the SANS website. OK, so well, that only leaves me to thank Mary very much for her excellent talk. And of course, the webinar team, Nathaniel, Tony and new member Emma. And of course, thank you for coming. And hopefully we'll see you all again at another SANS lecture or event. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.